Escalating military conflicts between Israel and Palestinian group Hamas bolstered the safe haven bid for gold and silver headed into this weekend. Gold is likely to close its best week in spot price performance since last March 2023 during the bank failure fiasco. More on that topic later on in this week's update. First, the ruling Hamas militant group in the Gaza Strip carried out an unprecedented multi-front attack on Israel at daybreak of last Saturday, firing thousands of rockets as dozens of Hamas fighters infiltrated the heavily fortified border in several locations by air, land, and sea, catching the country of Israel off guard on a major holiday. Headlines as of this afternoon, Friday, October 13, 2023, suggest escalating violence and Israeli boots entering Gaza. On the gold-related front regarding this week's geopolitical turmoil, some market commentators are openly speculating that a further gold price correction camp is perhaps too late as we've perhaps entered a price sea change. Of course, more time will tell on that short-term take. While some underlying gold derivative data is giving off bullish price patterns, what comes of gold in the coming weeks and months is still obviously unknown. New rigged CPI data this week and bony economists are out there publicly declaring that price inflation war is now won. And I'm not making this up either. Literally, Twitter had to fact check Paul Krugman's nonsensical tweet so onlookers could get better informed about his nonsensical viewpoint. Others piled on his silly comments by either using basic logic or merely the past three years of price inflation data to show that recent price inflation has already inflicted major damage on Main Street. We are now seeing record high 401k hardship withdrawal volumes and new U.S. home monthly mortgage costs compared to median household incomes has not hit levels this high, at least not this high in generations. Paul Tudor Jones is here to talk markets, rates, the Fed, and everything happening in the Middle East right now. He's the founder and CIO of Tudor Investments, founder, of course, of the Robin Hood Foundation. And it's great to see you here, especially at a moment where we're all trying to make sense of a lot of senseless uh, things. But let's start with Israel in terms of thinking about the geopolitical implications of this, but also how you think it's going to long term and short term affect markets. Well, I think Israel, obviously, it's a it's a huge tragedy, but you have to put it in a larger geopolitical context, which is we now have possibly three theaters where we're going to have geopolitical challenges. We've got the Middle East and Israel, obviously the Ukraine and Russia, and then at some point down the road, Taiwan and China. So it's a really, I, I would say since, certainly since I was born, it might be the most threatening and challenging geopolitical environment that I've ever seen because you have four nuclear powers, uh, three of whom are led by sociopaths, and that would be China, Russia, and North Korea. Obviously, those leaders have zero accountability, responsibility to anyone but themselves, and they have um, not an ounce of humanity in their bones because they regularly disappear, both their friends and their enemies. And then the fourth, Iran is led by someone who thinks God is talking to him and has uh, avowedly said that they want to remove from this earth a nation state with probably the most brilliant people ever assembled within a national boundary. So it's a really challenging environment. Uh, if you think about it too much, I want my lucky color to be invisible, right? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very threatening time. So that is also happening at the same time the United States is probably in its weakest fiscal position since certainly World War II with debt to GDP at 122%. So it's a really tough time for I think the moral voice of the world, certainly been the leader since World War II. It, it's, a, it's a really difficult time. Right, let's break this apart. I want to talk U.S. in just a moment, but mm -hmm. uh, to, to this existential risk that you talk about, mm -hmm. you know, these nuclear powers, mm -hmm. is there any way as an investor to even think about that beyond just the end? Meaning, do you say to yourself, I need to, dare I say, hedge myself against these 
risks, or do you say that these risks are just what they are, and so I, I, I have to keep going? I think we've become inured to headline risk. If you think about the market's reaction to what happened over the weekend, it was a linear response, right? It was, it was, it was risk off, but it wasn't anything that possibly recognizes just how dangerous this could be. So, uh, and I think that's because we've gotten exhausted with, with headline risk. It doesn't mean that we can't have a nonlinear reaction the markets down the road if something bad happens. And so it doesn't mean that. It means that I think at this point in time, we're just probably incorrectly exhausted by this seeing pretty this. pretty bad, though. Like what, when you say something bad happens, what would that have to be? Something that happens domestically? Well, I mean, if you think about, again, what happened, where this really gets bad is obviously if Iran and Israel get in direct conflict. That's when it really gets bad because then you've got um, the ability to have kind of a first world war cascade when everyone gets involved. Obviously, the big question now is, was Hamas a proxy for Iran like Hezbollah is or was it simply uh, an ally? And there's, a, there's big different responses that come from which one of those is ultimately determined by Israel. So, yeah, if from a personal standpoint, would I be investing in risk assets now in stocks until I saw what the resolution was with Israel and Iran? You know Israel's going to respond in some way, shape, or form. The determination right. of whether I, Iran was actually responsible is enormous because, again, it has the possibility to really escalate into something terrible. You just said, would you want to own equities? I mean, there's also the question of what you think is going on in the United States with our economy, with the rest of the world, with what the Federal Reserve is or isn't going to do. It's a, it's a, it's a really challenging time to want to be an equity investor in U.S. stocks right now. It's really hard because, again, you've got uh, the geopolitical uncertainty, which we, I think, come to live with to a certain extent. But again, all those have the ability to, uh, to have a nonlinear outcome. So something not just uh, business as usual. But I think, it's, I think equally as much of a problem is the fiscal situation that we're facing in the United States, which is gonna, which is gonna require a completely different political mentality that, to what that's pretty, that's pretty telling. So we're, you know, the possibility of a real possibility of a nuclear war is, right. is there, but our fiscal situation is just as bad. That's, I mean, that, that's a statement. So, so black swans, Paul, are no, they're not black swans anymore. They're, they're actual quantifiable risks. We need a new word for black swans. There's like four or five of them that used to be, you didn't even have to really, if, if it happened, we're all gone anyway, so you don't worry about it. But now they're actually something that are on your radar. Well, so yeah. is a pandemic, which was on your radar in, in Davos before anyone knew the word. I, I would say the fiscal situation is very different from other cataclysmic events that we've suffered as a country. It's not Pearl Harbor. It's not 9-11. It's not COVID, where we did not see them coming. They were external shocks. The fiscal situation we have is one that's really clear. Uh, and there are obvious remedies for it, and it's something that we're going to have to deal with. It's not part of the political dialogue yet, really. You're I don't think so. entitlements again. It's, it, well, it's a variety of things. But so mostly. If, if you just think about what's happened in, since really in the last three or four months, we're getting ready. I don't know if we'll have a Minsky moment in the bond market. I don't know if we'll have that point of recognition, but we're going to have the grinding reality that with 122 percent of debt to GDP, as interest costs go up the United States, you get in this vicious circle where higher interest rates cause higher funding costs, cause higher debt issuance, which cause further bond liquidation, which cause higher rates, which put us in an untenable fiscal position. We our interest bill is going to very shortly exceed our defense spending in just a couple of years. 
uh, our, it's probably in four or five years, Ceteris Paribus will have the highest interest bill as a percentage of GDP that we've ever had. It'll probably be close to 20% of your taxes will go to pay interest right. on the debt unless we do something. So, My view, I said it last time I was on, it's really about the long end of the curve, not the short end of the curve now. The Fed has sort of boxed itself into a corner. I don't really care if it stops at 550 or 575. Because if you look at the range of, of long-term yields, I mean, the 10-year was at 350 in May and was knocking on 5% a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I think that that's really the question. I think the Fed has done what it's going to do in this monetary cycle. I think it's going to step away. Um, I'm of a view that at some point in time, we're not there yet, that you're going to see some form of yield curve control brought in to stabilize the bond market. Um, but that's, you know, that's not this week. That's not this Wait, month. Hold on a second. Yield curve control in the United States. Yeah. Does that I, mean that essentially they're going to hold rates high, but that they're going to accelerate quantitative easing? Like they're going to quanti accelerate well, purchases I, I think, in the long I end? I think at the end of the day, financial stability is the unspoken mandate of the Federal Reserve. They talk a lot about unemployment and inflation. But when when things really come to a head, financial stability is, is, is number one. And we, we saw a taste of it exactly this time last year in the UK when the gilts market briefly, briefly dislocated. You know, I, I'm of the view that the Fed um, doesn't really have things under control. It's certainly not in control of the fiscal policy of this country. The fiscal policy of this country is, is reckless in the extreme. Um, and, uh, you know, I think at some point in the foreseeable future, you're going to have disorder at the long end of the curve. And I think that's going to be important enough that it, it, it becomes something the Federal Reserve get, get, gets involved in. The question is whether this is unique to the United States or whether it's, uh, or whether it's something, of a global, something of a global malaise. If it's, if it's unique to the United States, the dollar gets significantly weaker. If there's a host of, of G7 countries which are running similar deficits and have forced down similar paths, then it's a hard asset story. I think now the barbarous relics, and I would lump gold and Bitcoin together, I think they probably take on uh, a larger percentage of your portfolio than historically they would because we're going to go through both a challenging political time here in the United States and we're going to go through, we've obviously got a geopolitical right. situation. So I would, I would say... But high interest rates were supposed to be the thing that was actually going to be unhelpful to Bitcoin. Well, it, and I think on a relative basis, look what's happened to gold. It actually has been. Clearly, it suppressed it. So you know that more likely than not, we're going to go into recession. There's some pretty clear-cut recession trades. The easiest are the yield curve gets really steep. Term premium goes into the back ends of, uh, of debt markets, right, into 30-year into and 10-year and seven-year paper. Uh, the stock market typically right before recession declines about 12 percent that's probably going to happen at some point from some level uh, and you look at the big shorts and gold more likely than not in a recession the market's typically really long assets like bitcoin right. and gold so there's probably a 40 billion dollars worth of buying that has to come in to gold at some point between now and if that recession actually occurs um, so yeah, I, I like Bitcoin and I like gold right here. Hello, this is James Anderson on behalf of SD Bullion. Smash the like button if you enjoy these bullion market updates. And be sure to visit sdbullion.com forward slash sweepstakes to enter our free 500 ounce Silver Eagle coin giveaway. Want to win 500 Silver Eagle coins just like this guy? Yeah, this is Kevin. Hi, Kevin. This is Dr. Tyler Wall, CEO of SD Bullion. I'm calling to you to let you know that you won the SD Bullion giveaway of a monster box of 2022 Silver Eagle. Unbelievable. That is awesome. <laughs> so click the link below for your chance to win. Good luck to all of you out there who enter our free 500 ounce American Silver Eagle coin giveaway sweepstakes. The silver and gold markets closed this week, mainly riding up on ratcheting geopolitical risks outstanding. The spot silver price climbed and closed just under 23 an ounce ask price, and the spot gold price cleared 1,930 an ounce bid to finish this week. The spot gold silver ratio looks like it will finish the week flat at 85. The recent bullish short term drivers for gold are not as important as what is happening underneath the US and global banking system still. 
For instance, this week, speaking to the American Bankers Association, Fiat Federal Reserve Vice Chair of Supervision, Mr. Michael Barr, bluntly stated the following. Quote, Research suggests the costs of financial crisis are sizable. While estimates vary widely, the cumulative loss in economic activity is consistently estimated to lie above 20% of annual GDP and in some estimates up to 100% of GDP. For the United States, these estimates imply losses from financial crises of $5 trillion to $25 trillion based on current GDP numbers. The macroeconomic benefit of increased capital comes from reducing the likelihood of such a costly event. Better capitalized banks are better able to absorb losses and continue to lend to households and businesses throughout times of stress, which in turn helps to ensure that we have a healthy and strong economy. So doing some basic blocking and tackling for at some stage sharply increasing capital reserve mandates for U.S. banks, especially the largest commercial casinos, many of whom did not hedge the fastest increase of interest rates over the last 40 years leading to this ongoing graphic that I keep showing you of potential underwater bank bond holdings still threatening the system. And that's even with already over $100 billion in bank bailouts that have happened over the past year, the ones with one-term loans outstanding. We are already seeing calls, further calls, for more interventions and bank balance in bank op-ed pieces. For instance, this year was a call for a $1 trillion TARP 2.0 for a, quote, trapped asset relief program. Basically, loans uh, for underwater bank balance sheets that will be subsidized. This article's suggestion led to scorching hot takes online, like this one, basically stating that Bank of America is already on the edge of insolvency as we increasingly move nearer to 6% federal funds rates. Now, onlookers' anger and cynicism seems warranted, as many banks in the United States spent the last handful of years buying back and pumping their stock prices often reaping outsized bonuses in the processes. In a typical game of chicken where heads they win, uh, tails, we all lose the unsecured depositors and FDIC gets to bail them out or someone buys them out. They've done all this while using accounting trickery to bamboozle unsecured depositors and or investors who are looking at their balance sheets about outlying risks associated with exposure to their business models. Now, it certainly feels for myself and other onlookers that large portions of the global banking system are headed toward a comeuppance of epic proportions. Such large, seemingly inevitable outsized default risks are one of the major reasons we own and maintain prudently sized net worth positions in fiscal gold and silver bullion. That's going to be all for this week's SD Bullion Market Update. As always, to you out there, take good care of yourselves and those you love. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and share it with those you love. Subscribe to our channel and hit that alert button so you know when we publish new bullion market updates.